he is one of those very few people who can see far beyond the borders of current knowledge and see how things really work. He's just got this tremendous determination to, to live. And I, and I do think there is such a thing as the will to live. He will carry on until they push him underground. My name is Stephen Hawking. For the past 50 years, I have traveled the world, studying and lecturing about time and space. This film is a personal journey through my life, told in my own words. Come with me, and I will tell you the story of how I became who I am. in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. So you're going to take your lunch in the cafeteria? Yes. I think it would kill him if he was in a home being cared for by nurses. He likes to be able to choose what he wants to do with his life. He loves the danger of flying. He wants to go into space and he's been in submarines. <laughs> he's just the most craziest man. <laughs> he's got a lot of guts in him. Just through here is um, the nurse's room. So if anything medical happens, we'll just grab a phone, phone 999. But there is not much we can actually do because Stephen is on a nippy, which he'll breathe on. If that fails, the only other thing we could do, and we do have, um, we have oxygen cylinders and we can give him oxygen. But if he's in total state, then we will have to let him go. I have lived over two-thirds of my life with the threat of death hanging over me. Because every new day could be my last, I have developed a desire to make the most of each and every minute. Although I'm 71 now, I still go to work every day at Cambridge University. I'll see you in a bit. Enjoy shopping. Keeping an active mind has been vital to my survival, as has been maintaining a sense of humor. When um, I went to my job interview, I thought he was going to ask me about my past medical history and what I've done before in care. But he didn't. He asked whether I could cook poached eggs. <laughs> and <laughs> I was 19 at the time, and I lied because <laughs> I didn't know how to cook poached eggs. <laughs> Do you enjoy my company? Maybe. <laughs> You're horrible to me, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> As you can see, the gradual advance of my illness has meant that I am totally reliant on those around me. 71 years ago, life started that way too. I was born in 1942, exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo. It is often said that a person's early years are a good indication of how they will turn out. 
Perhaps my eldest sister Mary remembers me best. I remember Stephen was very bright, always into things. I remember my father made me a doll's house, so Stephen put in both plumbing and lighting. <laughs> I spend a lot of time playing on my own as a boy. I had a passion to understand how things worked. From toy trains to the whole universe. He would spend a lot of time looking at the sky, looking at the um, stars, and wondering where eternity came to an end. Home life was always stimulating for me and my siblings. We used to argue theology a lot. It's a great thing for kids because you don't need any facts whatsoever. To outsiders, the Hawking household was considered eccentric. But for me, it was a place where my mind was constantly challenged. I remember being quite gobsmacked by the conversation over lunch. Um, it was about subjects which were never talked about in my house. Sex, homosexuality, arguments for and against abortion, and various other subjects that were quite unusual. At school, my classmates gave me the nickname Einstein, even though I was only ever halfway up the class. It was, I like to think, a very bright class. It was always assumed Stephen would go to Oxford. Father thought it would be a good thing if Stephen did medicine. But Stephen was not into medicine. He'd made the most awful doctor, I was kidding. <laughs> so they compromised. We agreed on a degree in natural sciences specializing in physics. The prevailing attitude at Oxford at the time was very handy work. You were supposed to be brilliant without effort, or to accept your limitations and get a fourth class degree. To work hard to get a better class of degree was regarded as the mark of a gray man, the worst epithet in the Oxford vocabulary. I think Steve and I fell, both of us, right into that category that there was no need to work or appear to work. And uh, Steve was a very funny guy. He was able to appreciate jokes and tell jokes the whole time. And uh, spontaneous humor uh, uh, was uh, really his forte. So. I once calculated that I did about a thousand hours work in the three years I was there, an average of an hour a day. I'm not proud of this lack of work. I'm just describing my attitude at the time, which I shared with most of my fellow students. Within the whole year, people gradually thought of Steve as being the brilliant guy in the year. But he was brilliant in the sense that he could make off-the-cuff remarks, which were deep. So he was definitely a standout person of intellect. The question always was whether he would use that intellect to go anywhere. Well, if the number of campaign receptions one goes to is a measure of success, then it would seem that I have made it. Tonight, I am guest of honor at the launch of a supercomputer called Cosmos in Cambridge. Stevens, perhaps the world's most famous scientist, and, uh, you know, one can't deny that it's, it's fantastic to have his support. The notion of fame is a curious thing to me. In my mind, I am a scientist who has been lucky to work on some of the fundamental mysteries of our universe. 
Sometimes I wonder if I am as famous for my wheelchair and disabilities as I am for my discoveries. As my student days were in full swing, I was gradually becoming aware that all was not well. During my final year at Oxford, I fell over once or twice for no apparent reason. But then one evening, late at night, something more serious happened. I recall the time that Steve fell down the stairs. He fell downstairs all the way to the bottom. He lost consciousness, and then he couldn't remember who he was. But I recovered and soon had more pressing things on my mind. Despite my relaxed attitude to study, I graduated with first-class honors and left Oxford for Cambridge University to begin my PhD. Yet, little did I know, I would soon be diagnosed with a crippling illness that would change my life forever. Well, Stephen's speed of communication has very gradually slowed down. A few years ago, he was still able to use his hand switch and able to communicate by clicking this switch on his wheelchair. Um, when he wasn't able to do that anymore, we switched over to a switch that he mounted on his cheek. But with him slowing down with that, we've approached his sponsors, and so they've been looking into facial recognition. This is a, a high-speed camera which will allow us to see very fine details on the facial expressions, and this will help us to improve the rate of your speech and input. I have had to learn to live with my slow rate of communication. Okay. I can only write by flinching my cheap muscle to move the cursor on my computer. One day I fear this muscle will fail. Your current piece of software is a little dated. Well, it's a lot dated, but you're very used to using it. So we changed the method by which your next word prediction works, and it can pretty much pick up the correct word every single time, even if you're letters away from it. This is a big improvement over the previous version. I really like it. In 1962, age 20, when I arrived at Cambridge to begin my PhD, I was also desperate for my voice to be heard as I embarked on my first real scientific challenge. At the time, two theories battled to correctly describe the universe. The steady state theory held that the universe had always existed and would exist forever. But there was another, more exciting idea. The Big Bang Theory suggested that the universe had begun with a huge explosion. I decided to try to see if I could shed any light on how the Big Bang came to be. But, by now, the immediate challenge I was facing was to keep control of my body. My movements were becoming even more erratic. Though I was determined not to worry my family, so I tried to keep it to myself. Stephen went home for Christmas after one term, and the symptoms that he had had become too severe to hide from his parents. His father insisted on taking him to, I think, the family doctor first, and then that doctor recommended a specialist in London. I was in hospital for two weeks 
and had a wide range of unpleasant tests. They took a muscle sample from my arm and stuck electrodes into me. Eventually I was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis otherwise known as motor neuron disease or ALS. The prognosis was not good. I was given two to three years to live. It was always hard to tell how Stephen took it because he wouldn't talk about it. You know, if you can't do anything about it, you probably don't want to talk about it or or have people talk about it. He did seem pretty depressed, and I don't think he accepted it emotionally. Not knowing what was going to happen to me, or how rapidly the disease would progress, I was at a loose end. The doctors told me to go back to Cambridge and carry on with my research. But I was not making much progress, and anyway, I might not live long enough to finish my PhD. I felt somewhat of a tragic character. I took to listening to Wagner. I identified with it, and still do today. At first, the disease seemed to progress fairly rapidly. As time went by, however, it began to slow down. But what really made the difference was falling in love with a girl called Jane Wilde, whom I had met about the same time I was diagnosed. This gave me something to live for. Oh, he was great fun. He was eccentric. I was really drawn to his very wide smile and his beautiful grey eyes. And I think that's what made me fall in love with him. We were going to defy the disease. We were going to challenge the future. Jane was beautiful and gentle and seemingly undaunted by the harsh reality of my illness. <whistles> Falling in love and getting engaged was the motivation that I needed. If I were to get married, I had to get a job, and to get a job I had to finish my PhD. I therefore started working hard for the first time in my life. To my surprise, I found I liked it. It was terribly exciting, because he had been so depressed, and here he was with a new lease of life. Perhaps because I realized I might not have much time, I renewed my efforts to tackle the big question in cosmology in the early 60s. Did the universe have a beginning, or not? Many scientists were instinctively opposed to the idea of a Big Bang, because it implies a moment of creation. The hand of God. I wondered if the Big Bang could have happened on its own, without the need for a God to get it going. The key was in the theory of black holes. At the time, physicist Roger Penrose 
was working on what happens when a star collapses under the force of its own gravity. Penrose claimed the star would crush itself to a tiny point of infinite density, where even time itself would come to a stop. He called it a singularity, the heart of a black hole. I worked relentlessly to see if I could apply the notion of a singularity to the entire universe. Then suddenly, I had it. I imagined going backwards to the beginning, and worked out that right at the start, the universe would have been a singularity too. Here, time stops. You've reached the true beginning of everything. There is no previous time in which the universe could have had a cause. It spontaneously created itself in the Big Bang. The work that Stephen did basically showed there was a singular state which couldn't have come from a previous universe. So you could say it is a theory which tells you that the universe had a beginning. I had controversially shown the laws of nature suggest there is no need for a creator or God. The universe just came into existence all by itself. I applied for a research fellowship at Gonville and Keyes College which proved successful. The money from the fellowship meant that Jane and I could get married, which we did in July 1965. Stephen was walking with a stick and he was losing strength in his arms. And we went off for our honeymoon to upstate New York to a physics conference at Cornell University. And there I got to know that a goddess in Stephen's life with whom I was sharing the marriage was physics. After returning from our honeymoon, I completed and submitted my PhD thesis with the help of Jane who had spent many painstaking hours at the typewriter, typing it up. The findings in my thesis greatly enhanced my reputation in cosmology. Stephen's profile certainly did <laughs> rocket. <laughs> it's important to know that there was a Big Bang because that governs our cosmology. And the fact that it was a singular state is very much part of that understanding. My early work went some way to answering how our universe began. But there is still plenty more to find out. Brain world black holes should radiate if they aren't extreme, but slowly. At Cambridge, I mentor a new generation of cosmologists who are tackling ever tougher questions. It's this work that I enjoy the most. You might as well say the Schwarzschild solution doesn't exist because it radiates. Well, I'll have to think about it. In the autumn of 1970, I had been concentrating my research on black holes. By now, Jane and I had two children. Robert, aged three years, and Lucy, who had just been born. But at this time, my body was going into a rapid decline. At home, I was reluctant to ask for help from outsiders and was relying upon Jane more and more to help me get up in the morning, get dressed, and get to work. And when I got to Cambridge, I needed my students to help me too. Are we fine in this? 
Yes. I first met Stephen in 1972 at Cambridge when I became his PhD student. He was in a, in a wheelchair, and so I also had a role in, in, in helping him with eating and moving around and having coffee and tea and things like that. So it was a rather unusual relationship. Although I was becoming increasingly trapped inside my dysfunctioning body, fortunately my mind was unaffected. My next discovery would throw all of cosmologists' findings to date up in the air. The calculations I was working on involved what happened to particles on the edge of a black hole that were sucked in and disappeared. To my great surprise, I found that some particles could escape the black hole, which seemed to make a mockery of the known laws of physics. At first, I thought this must be a mistake. It was a very intense period. It was when he could be surrounded by children and not notice what was going on because he was like Rodin's thinker with his head in his hands, often accompanied by Wagner blaring out from the loudspeakers. to drive me spare. Finally, after months of exhaustive work, I found what I was looking for. Contrary to all previously held theories on black holes, I discovered that they must emit particles like a hot body losing heat. This evaporation meant in theory a black hole could eventually disappear. I announced my findings on St. Valentine's Day in 1974 at a cosmology conference in Oxford to a packed audience. He came to an end and there was absolute silence in the lecture hall. And I can see it now. The chairman of the lecture jumped to his feet and instead of saying, oh, I must thank Professor Hawking for his remarkable lecture, he said, this is preposterous. I've never heard anything like it. The whole place was a buzz. People couldn't believe what they had heard. My controversial discovery initially shocked the world of physics. But eventually it became accepted and known as Hawking Radiation. I am proud to have discovered it. This was a remarkably important result because it was a result which unified relativity theory and, and quantum theory and, and thermodynamics. And physics is really all about unifying ideas. These three subjects seemed to be brought together and this was the first time we'd seen that kind of unification. Oh, I was enormously proud, enormously proud of what Stephen had achieved. In the spring of 1974, I was inducted into the Royal Society, one of the most prestigious bodies of scientists. My name now sat alongside Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. Exciting new opportunities beckoned. Doors started to open for me. I was invited on a visiting professorship to the Californian Institute of Technology in Los Angeles. This meant moving with the whole family for the academic year, and the lure of the American West Coast was irresistible. I was simply hoping to have a year in which the result would be better science done by Caltech scientists, by my research group and others, 
and better science done by Stephen. Life in California was very different from Cambridge. I now had a large salary in a big house, just a stone's throw from the university. Yet, although we had all the mod cons that America could offer us, looking after two young children, and trying to cope with my ever-increasing disabilities, were causing too much strain on Jane. I could not see my way through what it was going to demand of me. And this wonderful idea came to me, if we were going to go to California, and the students were going to come too, why didn't we offer them um, a bed in our house in return for some help with Stephen? For me, that was a good deal, because I live rent-free in exchange for sort of helping Stephen out around the home, you know, at bath times and helping him with meals and things like that. But the excitement of a new life in California was harshly interrupted by my motor neuron disease. That was the year in which he lost the use of his hands. When he arrived, he could still write equations, though with some difficulty. By the end of the year, he couldn't. On the other hand, as he gradually lost the use of his hands, he further developed his unique ways of thinking. By losing the finer dexterity of my hands, I was forced to travel through the universe in my mind and try to visualize the ways in which it worked. He could move at lightning speed across the frontiers of knowledge and see things that nobody else could see. The disability forced him to carry himself in new ways, new directions. Turning problems over in my mind has been my main method of discovery for nearly half my life now. While all around me people have buzzed away deep in conversation, I have often been transported afar, lost inside my own thoughts, trying to fathom how the universe works. When we returned from California in the summer of 1975, much of the future, living with my illness, seemed uncertain. Although my increasing disabilities were greatly affecting my life more and more, I was fiercely reluctant to accept nursing care. I was convinced that I could build a team of people around me who could care for me in their own way. We didn't have any nurses at all in the department. That was part of my role. I would look after him. You'd like to reply to that one? Mm. I could see that when he was eating or, or drinking, this could um, cause a, a problem and a very big one for me because I didn't have any nursing uh, training whatsoever. <coughs> One night, Stephen had the most horrendous choking fit, and I just didn't know what to do. And everything just shook. Windows rattled, doors shook. It was the most terrifying experience, and it could have been critical. I was never really able to understand the strain it was placing on the people around me, especially Jane. I was beginning to feel that there were two faces to our situation. One was the public image, the wunderkind of physics um, who had overcome motor neurone disease, who was whizzing around the world in his wheelchair to receive honors and medals. And the other side, the other face, was 
a home situation where sometimes the illness forced us into our own little black hole. Despite the pressures on my family, I was determined to realize a lifelong ambition by writing a popular book about how the universe had begun. I wanted the book to be read by millions of people around the world like a best-selling airport novel. I did not think it would work. I did not think it would work because basically, uh, if you look at all the other books in airports, there are none like that. <laughs> However, I felt sure that the mass market would want to know about how the universe began. By 1984, I had completed the first chapter. We had a contract ready for him to sign, and I had heard that he was going to be in Chicago. So I was there and waiting, and then this car pulls into the parking lot, and this gentleman gets out, and he goes back to the passenger door and scoops what looks like a kind of life-size broken doll uh, into his arms and brings it back to the wheelchair and kind of gently eases the doll into place. And suddenly, the doll becomes animated. As soon as that hand is on the controls, the thing literally, it kicks into life, spins around two, three times, and takes off. And then Brian shouts to me, I've gotten out of my car. He shouts, is that you? Is that Peter Gazzotti? And I said, yes, it's, it's me. And he says, well, quick, follow us. That's Professor Hawking. I signed up with Peter and set to work completing the first draft of my book. I tried to simplify the physics as best I could, and by the end I was pleased and felt it was in pretty good shape. But Peter wasn't convinced. I was pretty disappointed. Yeah, I thought this is gonna be really difficult. But I just decided we'd made a substantial commitment to it, and by God, we were gonna do this book, so let's just start slogging. And then maybe lightning would strike or something wonderful would happen. Lightning did indeed strike, but not in the way that Peter and I were hoping. That summer I had taken a break from rewriting to travel to Switzerland on holiday. But while I was there, I caught a chest infection that developed into pneumonia and quickly became very serious. I was put into a drug-induced coma and onto a life support machine. The doctors thought I was so far gone, they offered a chain to turn off the machine. But she refused. Finally, Jane insisted that I was flown back to Cambridge. I remember very vividly walking through the doors and being really quite rocked by what I saw when I got in there. And I realized that Stephen was really very, very ill. The weeks of intensive care were the darkest of my life. The surgeons had to perform a tracheotomy to allow me to breathe, which made a small incision in my windpipe and connected me to a ventilator via the hole in my throat. As a result, I was now robbed of the ability to talk. I faced a life unable to properly communicate. All hopes of finishing my book, and perhaps even my career, seemed to be over. It was difficult to think that Stephen was going to come out of there and be okay. Being on a ventilator meant that I needed constant care and monitoring. Once nurses came into the house, life changed. And that was very difficult for all of us. For me, for the children. Home was no longer home. There was no privacy, no privacy, because 
the walls were listening to everything. Despite the intrusions on family life, with the nurse's help, I grew stronger. Yet, I still felt trapped inside my body. For a time, at home, I could communicate only by raising my eyebrows when someone pointed a letter on a card. All thoughts of work and finishing my book grew distant. But then quite unexpectedly, a glimmer of hope came from across the water. I got a call from a physicist, and he said, I've got uh, someone in England, he's a professor of physics, who lost the ability to speak, and he needs a system. This system was called Equalizer, and the top part of the screen was a, a set of letters, rows of letters. And then the bottom part of the screen was rows of words, 36 very frequently used words. He learned that very quickly, and I was blown away by it. He was, he was uh, scanning just amazingly fast. I was keen to make up the lost time that my illness had forced upon me. I had a stack of notes from Peter Gazzardi suggesting changes and clarifications to my book. After months of work, the rewrite was complete. None of us really knew whether the book would be liked and would sell as we all hoped for. All we could do now was give it a title, a brief history of time, send it off to the printers, and wait. But to everyone's surprise, the book sold copy after copy. I had no expectation that it would be the number one best-selling book in the world. I mean, not just here, but Germany, Slovenia, France, Italy, everywhere in the world, there was the hope that someone had found the mystery of life. And from then on, it was just a race to keep the book in print and, and uh, kind of marching towards a million copies sold. <laughs> you know, it was very gratifying. Uh, you know, in the 38 years that I've been in this business, um, I don't think I've ever had a book that stayed at the top of the bestseller list that long. Professor Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, an unlikely but successful publishing phenomenon. A Brief History of Time has sold about 8 million copies. A Brief History of Time stayed in the bestseller list for over four years and entered into the Guinness Book of Records for doing so. To date, over 10 million copies have been sold worldwide. Over the next few years, a lot of fuss was made about my book. I became famous nationally and around the world. And I have made a cameo appearance on Star Trek, my favorite sci-fi show. You are bluffing. Wrong again, Albert. I enjoyed the media attention and witnessing everyday people getting more involved in understanding the physics of our universe. But, sadly, this newfound fame put more strain on my marriage. It was clear that my life and chains were beginning to follow different paths. We were engulfed and swept away by this great wave of fame and fortune. And I have to say that really, it all got rather too much for me to cope with. And I suppose that's when we ceased to be as happy as we had been. And then when the marriage broke up, I felt as if a rug not just had been pulled up from under my feet, but the earth had opened up under that rug and swallowed me up because the marriage had been my raison d'etre. And it took me quite a little while to recover my sense of my own identity. 
In 1990 we separated, and were divorced in 1995. All those years with Stephen were a huge part of my life. They were my young years. They were my children. And I can't just wipe those from the record, and I wouldn't want to. And I'm very, very proud of what Stephen has done. In 1995, I announced my engagement to Elaine Mason and married again. Elaine had been one of my nurses from the start of my 24-hour wraparound care. Over the years, we had become extremely close as Jane and I drifted apart, each seeking comfort and love through new relationships. My marriage to Elaine was passionate and tempestuous. She saved my life on several occasions. But unfortunately, being in the public eye can have its drawbacks, and journalists began prying into our private life. The low point was when the press printed unsubstantiated allegations that I had been the victim of domestic violence. To my mind, this was a gross invasion of our privacy, and was an extremely hurtful and damaging time for us both. We were together for 11 years, before divorcing in 2006. Living a very public life does however have its upsides too. At work, I am often visited by famous people who share an interest in space and the universe we live in. Sometimes, even astronauts drop by. My voice is listened to because I did something 43 years ago. But I believe that he is valued more because he has the, uh, the pure analytical combined with the philosophical that comes from his understanding of the beginnings and the ends of the universe. I have often dreamt about traveling through space myself. Recently, I got closer by experiencing a zero-gravity flight. that one day space travel will become an everyday necessity for human civilization. At 71, I remain hopeful that I will be one of the first ordinary people to blast off into space. But I will need a little help. You know, we haven't offered anybody a free ticket, but it was the one person in the world that we, that we felt, you know, we, we'd love to invite to space. And it was incredible when he accepted. He told me to hurry up and get the spaceship built because he wasn't going to live forever. And hopefully next year we'll take him up. Becoming a so-called famous person has brought me unusual privilege and opportunities. Stephen Hawking, the world's smartest man. What are you doing here? If you are looking for trouble, you found it. Yeah, just try me, you... Oh! It has been a lot of fun, and also very strange, to see myself depicted in different ways. But, perhaps the strangest, is to have had part of my early life portrayed by an actor. I felt a huge onus of responsibility to get that part of his life right. There was so much that happened to him. It's a terrifying prospect to have a completely functioning mind inside a body that locks you in, that keeps you stationary. One of the things I wanted to get right was to show the stages of the progression of his condition. He's incredibly stoic. 
I think that was probably the case when he was younger as well. I think he rolled up his sleeves and got on with it and look at the results. I mean, it's self-evident. The man became uh, a spokesperson for the most complex ideas. Oh, hi, Stephen Hawking. I can't believe it. Whenever I do a talk show, most people see Dumb and Dumber and they assume that that's who I am. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to like partner up with the smartest man on the earth. I have just wanted to call with the hell you have that land and you're excited about the new electronic universe theories. It's amazing. But don't bother trying to explain it to them. <laughs> the pea bridge cannot grasp the idea of the world of the bridge. Yeah, I know. I was expecting him to be so serious about himself, and uh, I think it was a relief for him to uh, to completely make fun of the whole thing. Well, I had to go now. I am very busy watching Dumb and Dumber. I hope I can do the a bit. You truly are genius. No, you're a genius. No, you are. <laughs> no, you are. After we did the routine we kind of struck up a friendship. So I was invited to his home. And while we were having dinner, I asked him, you know, just for a picture, could you could you run over my foot with your wheelchair? And that, <laughs> so I have a picture of me grimacing in agony and stuff. So it was wonderful, wonderful to be there, wonderful to talk to him. Nowadays, more and more of my time is taken up with my public life. If you want to explore the inside of a black hole, choose a big one. People have searched for many black holes of this mass, but have so far not found any. This is a pity, because if they had, I would have got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Life has thrown at me, both good times and bad. Perhaps it is human nature that we adapt and survive. As for me, I'm not afraid of dying, but I have so much I want to do and find out first. I like it. Okay, you're gangster hat. <laughs> it's the doll. <laughs> One advantage of being a public figure is being asked to do special things. Today I am center stage at the opening ceremony of the Paralympics Games. I am honored to have been asked. Ever since the dawn of civilization, people have craved for an understanding of the underlying order of the world. The Paralympic Games are all about transforming our perception of the world. We are all different. There is no such thing as a standard or run-of-the-mill human being, but we share the same human spirit. So let us together celebrate excellence, friendship, and respect. Good luck to you all. Hawking is made possible in part by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. To learn more about Stephen Hawking, please visit pbs.org forward slash Hawking. Hawking is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.